powered industrial processes. I hope you all can listen to me very well and the connection is working well. Fernando, is it like this? Uh, yeah, yeah, everything is fine. You can... Uh, yeah, uh, okay, so let's start. Um, yeah, let me give only a few words about us as a company and then I would like to speak today primarily about uh, desalination, uh, but I've, a, a few slides I would like to speak about uh, uh, another uh, energy intensive process like electrothermal processing as well. Um, but let me start with some um, basics, uh, basic thinking from our side about wind-powered industrial processes. What, what is it? What, uh, what are the main uh, issues of that? So this is what I would like to speak about. Synlift Systems, my company, uh, is from its beginning on a project developer for turnkey wind power plants uh, worldwide. Uh, we, uh, we offer the full range of services from early stage investigation, the whole range of project development up to final operation management. Uh, we do it not with, with very large wind farms, we do it with smaller projects. And from 2003 on we are, uh, uh, have business activities in the Arab world and so we have been faced within, with the challenges of desalination and desalination is an issue what is uh, placed on the shoreline where we have for sure uh, good uh, solar radiation but good to excellent wind conditions in coastal areas worldwide. That's why the question to combine uh, these technologies is, is not, not new and uh, is very um, yeah, clear for, for people who are dealing with that one. So that's why we, we developed in the last years our own technology for wind power desalination. But additionally to that, we are uh, offering consulting services for, us, for other potential wind power applications, for instance, wind power electrothermal processing. So when we speak today about wind-powered industrial process, the, the um, overall thinking behind is uh, that we live, especially in Europe, but in other uh, parts of the world uh, as well, there is a very strong development with renewable energies. And simply said, we rely on more and more on unreliable sources. So that means this is, uh, yeah, this sounds like a challenge, and it is a challenge. The higher the, the, the share of, of wind and solar power, um, semi-predictable sources, uh, the more challenging is to create a, a finally stable energy and demand uh, system. You have different measures to, to deal with this challenge. One is uh, on the generation side. That means you are flexibilize your power generation capacities. You have more uh, very flexible conventional power uh, 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 facilities and so on. This is one thing. Another thing is strongly focused in the discussion is the storage issue, but I would like to say uh, not only to focus only on storage questions. Storage is an essential thing, but not the only one, as we can see here. Um, the distribution is another one. That means so we can balance over regional uh, uh, differences in, in natural resources uh, if we would have a, a very complex distri distribution system. And last but not least, and this is um, currently a little bit underestimated in the discussion, what about the consumption? Normally we take the view that we want to do something at which time we, we ever want. So, But the more we reliable on these 
semi-predictable sources, uh, we should flexibilize our demand side as well. This is a simple thing, but this can, uh, this can make the overall process much easier. So that's why uh, we speak about uh, demand side management or load management. Um, <clears throat> and for that one, we, let's say we have two approaches. Uh, we call the, 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 in the first one the interregional approach. That means, uh, yeah, by means of uh, suitable trading and pricing models, you can stimulate the demand side to to consume more in periods when there is more uh, power supply from the renewable side. Um, and all this is currently described uh, with the smart grid uh, philosophy. Yeah? Not to go too much in detail with that, but this is, this is the so-called so interregional approach for load management. But we have the local approach as well. So that means uh, we, we know this here uh, in Germany and I think in other countries as well. Um, the, the photovoltaic system on the roof structure. At the moment, it is still attractive to, to fed this photovoltaic power into the grid. But we have a system what is uh, annually reducing the feed-in tariff. So there is very, very soon there will be the day that we have the, the grid parity and uh, the end users uh, think about how to use a maximum share of their own photovoltaic power uh, for themselves. And this come down to the same questions, to load management, to store things. Yeah, that's, that's why uh, this load management, this can be done on a local level, let's say so, or uh, stimulated by interregional system. This is um, yeah, at this moment. <clears throat> When we speak about this local approach, the last one, then let's have a look on this slide. Um, when we have wind power and we have a consumer, then principally we, we have uh, two options. So the left one shows us uh, there is an independent feed-in point for the wind power uh, generation. And uh, on another point, there is the consumer and take the energy. So that means we have a third party in the game. This is the grid operator. And we are dependent on his conditions. So, OK, it makes us very flexible because we can place wind power on the windy places. And uh, so there is no, we are not forced to bring the things close to each other. But the other thing is we have a third party in the game, what in many countries in the world make, this, make the issue not so easy. If we would, uh, right hand side, if we would uh, bring wind energy close to the consumer and we would form a subgrid, then uh, it is on us uh, in which way we are interact with the grid operator. Yeah? So then there is no grid use uh, with all the fees and taxes uh, respectively. Um, so we can act uh, as much as we want or as we can within this subgrid solution with ourselves. So these are the two options as for, uh, we call it local approach, how to combine wind power with the consumer side. Yeah, and uh, now I would like to uh, come back to uh, this uh, item of energy intensive industrial processes. Yes, I, I think you are today primarily interested in desalination, but to understand the desalination in relation to other uh, processes, let me give you these two examples. Oh, let's say there are two types. Um, one type, type one here, has a very or comparatively low uh, energy consumption per unit produced. But on the other hand side, the total amount of units produced per period is very high. This is typical for a membrane process, for instance, seawater desalination. That means here, you see it down there, um, there is a, um, there is a, maybe it's easier. 
to to support this with an, with an arrow. Does it work? No, arrow is not working. Pointer. Can you help me with, with the pointer? Hello, Fernando. Can uh, you hear yeah. me? Can you help me with the pointer? How can I activate it? Uh, it was activated. Now it's uh, deactivated. So oh, let me. Yeah. Uh, now it's in the middle of the. Where is it? You can you can click. Um, ah here. Yeah. Ah okay. Yeah, okay. it's more yeah, now. Sorry for that. Now, back again. Yeah. Energy intensive process type one with a comparatively low energy consumption per unit, but in uh, a high o total amount of units produced per period is membrane process. Here we see the energy uh, consumption is between three and a half and five and a half kilowatt hour per cubic meter or per ton, and the total amount of production of mm, common plants is, let's say, between 500 and 300,000 uh, cubic meter or tons per day. So the energy share of product costs for seawater desalination is ranging between 30 and 60 percent. So the type 2 has a, a much higher energy consumption per unit, like electrothermal, for instance, alum aluminum melting. Um, this is ranging between 410 to 690 kilowatt hours per ton, much higher compared to seawater desalination. But the overall amount of units produced per day, uh, it's uh, much lower. So, and the energy share, as I learned, ranged between five and 20 percent. So that means these are typical energy intensive process, but with with very different characters. Process with high level of energy demand and or energy share of product costs are ideal to be developed as wind powered industrial processes. So now let me come back to the question why wind power. I think it is it is well known that uh, wind and solar are dominating the renewable energy market. Um, but let's give some figures um, to have this in mind uh, one more time. Uh, we assume that fossil fuel power generation, um, the cost for that one, not in a small scale, let's say minimum 5 megawatt uh, installed capacity, are ranging uh, dependent on the kind of fuel between 3 and 10 euro cent per kilowatt hour. So wind power, uh, not in a very small scale, but in a medium or large scale as well, that means minimum one megawatt uh, installed capacity, is ranging in the same field. That means when we have modern wind turbines with long blades and we have a, a, a wind uh, a, a good wind side uh, or an excellent wind side, then we can come down significantly lower than five euros that we can come down so and so that my that's why between three and ten uh, euro cent per kilowatt hour dependent on the turbine technology and the availability of wind at site is a typical uh, power production cost range for wind power that means uh, this is what what fernando said at the beginning wind power can compete already today with, without any subsidies with large-scale power generation from the conventional side. So uh, photovoltaics, everybody knows that, is, uh, um, is making a strong development in the last, especially in the last few months. So in the Sunbelt region or in southern Europe, uh, we come down to, let's say, 1,800 uh, full load hours um, and with a dramatically reduced uh, investment cost in the last few months, we come down to, uh, yeah, here you can see 12 between 32, so there's a wide range. Um, uh, power production costs as well. So here, this is what I'm speaking about. The solar 
thermal power generation, this has been discussed two or three years ago very strongly with all the death attack initiatives. Uh, this at the moment uh, can, cannot answer to this uh, strong development uh, on wind and photovoltaic side. And only in a very large scale it comes down to 1920 uh, euro cent per kilowatt hour. Yeah. What is the what is the benefit, as Fernando said as well, of these free accessible sources like wind and sun? Um, there will be a very limited price increase uh, in the future. That means when the investment is done uh, in the next 20 years, the production costs should be uh, very clear, predictable. You may say there can be some unsudden or some sudden um, repair works and not foreseen. But in general, the more this technology is implemented and is running, uh, the more experience does the community have. Um, and so I would say um, we have a very clear uh, perspective uh, about the cost development of in, in a completed wind power and solar power plant. So, uh, in contrary to the fossil fuel, as we all know, or nobody will know uh, what about the price uh, in the next 10 years. So that, and there is a very strong volatility dependent on the demand side. So that means uh, wind power um, at many coastal sites is competitive with large-scale fossil fuel power generation already today tendency increasing. Yeah? I say, let me say it one more time. We speak about desalination. Desalination is a coastal issue, and there we have good to excellent wind conditions worldwide. So that's why this combination between wind power and desalination uh, should be on a table and is on a table for many years. Wind power is mainly independent of price trends and volatility. This is what I said before. Yeah. Um, when we speak um, about um, an optimal system, then uh, we have to consider the tariffs of the grid. I said uh, we, we are not speaking about small-scale standalone system. We are grid connected, and uh, one option is the so-called subgrid option. And with the subgrid, uh, we have two uh, parameters. One is the grid tariff itself. That means how much I have to pay for grid power. Uh, and the other one is how much uh, will I uh, get, receive uh, for fed in wind power. So uh, that means if the grid power is very low, then uh, the question is why should we run a wind-powered process? If it's extremely low and, let's say, subsidized, then many decision-makers vote for a conventional process. If the grid tariff medium, then uh, let's run a wind-power process, and the question then, it, it is worth it to have a load management, or should we run without load management? Here, this is what I'm speaking about. But when the grid tariff is very high, then it's worse to substitute, substitute uh, um, the conventional power by wind power. And we, we can activate additional measures like load management to do that very uh, intensively. On the other hand side, the feed-in tariff for wind power, if this is low, then it's not worse to have too much wind power uh, because uh, then you may uh, uh, feed in some remaining uh, wind power into the grid and the, nobody is paying for that or only a, a low tariff, then uh, we should run a process with low wind. With medium feed-in tariff, uh, then we speak about a wind-powered process. I will show you the, the, the pictures after then, but only to have this overall logic. And if the feed-in tariff should be very high, then uh, some of the decision makers may focus on a wind project and will couple uh, a small process behind. Um, so it sounds a little bit abstract. Let's, let's uh, have a look here on these pictures. Uh, this is the first one, what I spoke about, the, the um, 
uh, feed-in for wind power, the feed-in tariff, it, it would be very low and it's, it's not worse to, to uh, feed in uh, surplus wind power than install only a few wind power capacity here, only a few, uh, so that in, in no way you would have surplus wind power to feed into the grid. The red line here is your assumed consumption, let's say a industrial process, whatever it is, and you run it c continuously and you replace, as you see here, an average, let's say, 30% of the energy demand um, because you, you installed only a limited capacity for wind power. But this we call, this is a process here, the red one, with wind power support. Yeah. Um, if we install more, this is here case two, in a way that in a period, let's say one year, uh, we, we generate at this side with this, wind con with this local wind condition um, the same amount as we need, then we call this, this is a really wind powered process. But as you see, if there is no load management, the normal is that you generate too much, what you have to fed into the grid, or you have not enough, then the complementary part you have to take out of the grid. These are the, the red uh, areas remaining here. So, and uh, last but not least, co uh, case three is we installed um, the highest amount of wind power because one reason may be uh, we have a very attractive feed-in tariff and uh, we create, uh, compared to our uh, consumption, a lot of surplus wind power what we fed into the grid um, and uh, yes, uh, much more than we need for the process. This is from business model is primarily a wind power project and there is only a small consumer coupled. Yeah. This is the three options we principally we would have uh, in a wind powered process as for the wind power capacity to be installed. So and this come down as you can see here uh, summarizing uh, to the uh, to the overall energy balance you see here um, uh, case one up there we have only a limited share of energy demand we have uh, offered or delivered by wind power. This is, a, let's say, one third. Here in the wind power process, but without any uh, load management, with a constant load, we can come up to about 50% uh, direct use of wind power for the process. And the remaining uh, energy we have to exchange via grid. Yes, we said uh, here the same amount of energy over one year, let's say, is generated by this turbine. That means all what we cannot use directly has to be fed in and in other periods has to be taken out of the grid. So that means these both uh, elements here should be equal provided uh, the overall balance is zero. And last but not least, as I said, uh, case three, we have much more energy uh, as we need for ourselves. So that means uh, we fed a lot into the grid. But uh, what we really need from the grid is a very small case for our own consumption. Okay, next slide. <laughs> Um, the, the parameter, what shows us in which way the wind power or another fluctuating source like solar is integrated in our system. Also the, the level of system integration is performed by the parameter wind penetration. Simply that it's, it's the wind energy we use directly for the process in relation to the overall energy demand of the process. And what are the influential or the most influential parameters for that? This is the wind power capacity itself. We spoke about this just now. This is the issue of storage capacity, and we will learn or we will see. We can we have two options for this storage issue. And last but not least, we can influence the wind penetration uh, with a load management. So. Let's see here the same figures. Um, okay, one more time. 
the wind penetration, what stands for the share of self-consumption of wind power for the process related to the overall demand, will be influenced by, mainly influenced by these three parameters, wind power capacity installed, storage capacity, and process load management. So this pic picture you know, this one more time, this shows us here the, the, wind, the influence of wind power capacity uh, in relation to the, to the wind penetration, that means to the uh, self-consumption of wind, wind energy. Let's come to the storage issue. This was the, the second one. And I think, uh, let, me, let me speak a little bit because this is an uh, essential thing. It is, uh, it is simple, but uh, to make this clear, give me this chance to do that. Well, again, when we rely on an unreliable sources like wind, and at the end of the day, we want to have a, a liable product, then we have to buffer. We have to store in between this process chain. So uh, we, can, we have two options. The one thing is the so-called energy storage. That means here is coming the fluctuating energy. We store the energy. That means bef before the process. And out of the, the energy storage, we take the energy in a conventional way to run a conventional process. This is option one, st storing on the energy side. So we can store on the product side as well. So here, at the end of the queue, here is our consumer, and he wants to have a reliable final product. That means where we buffer uh, principally, this is on us. So here is the, the second option, we, we store on the product side, that means behind this process. So here the, the fluctuating energy is coming, we have to flexibilize our, um, our process in order to, to tackle or to deal with this fluctuating power supply. That means we are producing fluctuating as well put our uh, uh, final product in a, yeah, product storage here and for water it's a tank, and then we take out in a reliable way, maybe in a constant way, our final product. So these are these, these both options we have. We all know uh, storing of products is very simple and cheap. If, it's, if this is textiles or water or whatever, to store this is very simple. And it's finally, it is stored, uh, uh, it is energy, a kind of energy storage materialized in products. But as we see here, uh, in order to, to run the process flexible, we need surplus capacities. So because the, the energy is coming uh, in over average uh, periods and in under average periods, under average is not the problem. We can, we can go in part load with our process. That means we can stop one, one module. Here, if we have two, we can stop one to follow in part load periods. But what about uh, uh, over average periods? For that one, in, an, in a general way, we need uh, additional capacity to run this. This is uh, suboptimal, let me say so, for our overall economics, because we compared to that one, we need an additional capacity, what is not running all the time, because we need it only for these uh, over average periods. Uh, let's say we have a very cheap way of, of uh, storage facilities, but we need additional capacities. So the premium solution would be the following. If we would be able to run with the same number of capacities, here up here you have two, and here you have two as well, that means we have no really uh, additional capacities, uh, and we would be able to overrun uh, these um, installed capacities uh, for these limited period with over average power supplies. If this is possible, it depends on each single uh, process, but if this is possible, then this would be the premium solution, because we have this very simple and cheap way of of uh, materialized energy storage here on the product side. 
but we don't need uh, really uh, additional capacities to run this. Yeah? That's why uh, we are looking for this option because this seems to be the, the most beneficial one. Yeah, and here um, the, the last issue, what about the load management? Um, let me explain that here. This is for desalination. Uh, you may have a, a very fluctuating wind scenario and your load management uh, try to follow up uh, or to, to run hard with the wind. We are grid connected, that means it's not necessary to run extremely hard with the wind. If there are some short-term strong winds, um, the, the load management can decide uh, we don't use it, we fed it into the grid, or there is a sudden reduction in wind speed uh, and uh, the, the process is not following here, so we take the remaining energy out of the grid. So there is a remaining uh, energy exchange via grid. You see here the yellow uh, peaks fed in and the red one is taken out of the grid. But compared to, uh, to uh, processing without load management, let's see here, uh, the, the exchange via grid is significantly reduced. Okay. Now we have these influences uh, for, the, uh, for the wind penetration. And here this is, um, before I leave, um, um, let, me, let me explain this here. Uh, you have modularized your system. Here is an example for desalination. That means uh, this is your average capacity uh, you uh, have to run. And now there is under average uh, power supply period. You follow by deactivating one uh, module and only the remaining one is running and is running in part load as well. And when you're down there, uh, then you, s you can stop both because you still have uh, water into the tank, what you can deliver uh, to the client as, as long as you have. Yeah. So if the, if the tank is empty, then you have to refill it uh, with conventional power when there is uh, no wind for a long time. So, but here the wind is, is uh, increasing again. That means we are following and up to here, both uh, uh, modules are running with 100%. And now we are coming to this over average period and you increase your temporary production to a certain level. So this is, as I said before, this is the premium solution for load management. It's not working with every process. Here, these are the only, um, um, the only two slides about uh, wind-powered electrothermal processes. Um, I'm, I've been asked to speak about mainly desalination. But here uh, is one picture. Um, here you can see uh, the, in the same way the wind power forming a subgrid with an electrothermal process. And here you may have uh, options uh, of electrical storage or thermal storage as well in order to, um, to run the process uh, with the load management, uh, let's say, with the wind. So what does it mean? Uh, Simply said, um, if, you, um, if you would have an additional, um, uh, what is this right word here, in, um, a melting pot, then in case of strong wind periods, you would be able to melt more metal. This is theoretically. You may say this depends on if it's copper or if it's, uh, what kind of metal is it. But Principally, uh, to understand the principle, in case of uh, um, uh, strong wind periods, uh, over average uh, power supply by wind power, you would be able to flexibilize your electrothermal process in a way that you melt more, surplus uh, melting. And for the uh, following low wind period, you have enough uh, material melted in order to work in the same way as you did uh, uh, normally. So um, that means um, type A, it's, this is one option, 
you have a variable melting, but you have to uh, you have to keep the thing warm. Uh, there are no new media and technologies necessary, only a surplus melting capacity. Um, the casting process is unmodified, um, and this is a very known procedure because in peak loads, uh, the industry, the electrothermal process industry, is doing this uh, for many years. So on the negative side, that uh, the heat holding and the storage ability, um, this is dependent on the temperature, the melting temperature of each individual metal uh, and your insulating um, materials you need. That means um, uh, you, have, you may have losses when your temperature level of the melting metal is too high and your insulating materials uh, or insulating capacity is lim limited. So, on the other, uh, the other option you may have is a variable melting and casting. That means in case of strong periods, I melt more and uh, bring it into cast uh, in the same way. Um, so, I don't need additional uh, uh, melting uh, capacities. So, uh, but the challenging thing, what most or a lot of uh, op process operators will deny, is that you have to flexibilize your casting process as well, and this might be challenging for the internal procedure of of the company. Yeah, but theoretically, uh, for this uh, electrothermal processing, you may have these two options. But this is only two slides. Come back to the desalination. I think most of you uh, may come from the desalination uh, background. That's why let me go through very fast through, through that one. Uh, we have this um, classical distillation procedure and the membrane process. The yeah. mm, excuse me, Joachim. Yeah. Uh, just a housekeeping announcement. In the meanwhile, um, I'm sorry, I, I think I forgot to indicate to you that uh, everybody can submit their questions at any moment of the presentation uh -huh. using the Q&A pod, which is on the lower left corner, uh, because now contents are, um, we have a lot of contents, so maybe you have a question, so do not hesitate to submit in real time to this Q&A pod, and we will handle uh, at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. So uh, don't hesitate, and if, um, as well, if you want to uh, introduce yourself, you can use the introductions uh, chat. So, and now, Joachim, um, thank you, and you can uh, should, I, should I answer one question now, or, or should... No, no, we will do uh, all together at the yeah, end, at the end. Uh, okay. at the end of the, of the yeah. presentation. So you can, you can so, go ahead. Thank you. That, yeah, thanks a lot, Fernando. Um, yeah, we have these, as I said, these, these uh, two, uh, two kinds of, of desalination processes. There's a single phase. We do not change the phase with membrane process, and uh, the, the main uh, example for this is reverse osmosis. And we have, on the other hand side, these phase change thermal processes. And um, as you can see here, um, the energy uh, consumption is significantly different. Yeah? So that means membrane process reverse osmosis is today state of the art. You may find in Gulf region, um, even in new projects, thermal processes, but I think uh, it is, uh, this is sure that a membrane process will have the future. Yeah. Or it's not only my private view, um, this is membrane process, and that's why uh, I speak about uh, membrane process in the following slides. Here are some pictures or some information about investment costs uh, compared to, to uh, thermal, uh, um, thermal uh, desalination and reverse osmosis, but I see just now the figures are not very new, so that's why. Um, yeah, and, and as I said, uh, RO is clear dominating the market in, uh, in, new, um, in new plants. Yeah, the, the simple uh, um, procedure here for uh, participants who are not coming from 
with uh, desalination background. We have these high pressure pumps. We have here uh, the membrane cells separating uh, the, the permeate and the concentrate, and the concentrate is still under pressure, is going back to the energy recovery system. And depending on the energy recovery uh, technology, uh, take the energy uh, share higher or a little bit lower back to the high pressure pump and uh, do it um, again. So this is uh, um, the energy recovery system. Yeah, and uh, we are often asked what about variable operation from reverse osmosis because from, from conventional point of view it will be done in a steady way, in a more constant way. And that's why, uh, let me go through here, the preconditions for variable wind powered operation. Uh, we need a broad load range to avoid excessive modularity and frequent aviation deactivation sequences. Uh, we need a low and uniform energy consumption per unit of product within the total load range. This is uh, optimally, uh, or this is um, positively what we are looking for, yes. And uh, we need a high process dynamic to adjust the process to the fluctuating wind power quickly. But all that, all that is principally possible with reverse osmosis. The challenges at the moment were, um, or in the last few years, were common operation is uninterrupted and at nominal capacity with constant parameters. So that means no long-term experiences of membrane behavior under strong variable operation were and still today are existing. So that means uh, tests for long-term uh, long tests with variable and strong operated membranes um, should have been done and have been done. So uh, we ourselves internally here in Berlin, we run uh, the membrane, the membrane uh, in parallel ways. That means constant one one train and parallel to that in a very in a variable way as well. Um, so uh, with the same average, uh, and uh, we, we did it two years to 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 learn about. Uh, maybe a fatigue behavior or something like that uh, about or bad influences on membranes um, on a, with this very uh, fluctuating processing or variable processing and the results were very clear there's no deterioration of variable operated membrane uh, being observed so that means they are working very robust the membrane themselves yeah and what about the fatigue behavior of of pumps and of other connections or the um, this is a, another issue but the membrane at the heart of the the uh, reverse osmosis system itself is acting very robust against these uh, strongly fluctuating processes so um, here you can see some of our results both both uh, uh, streets are running and give very similar uh, results over a long period. Now I'm looking on the, on the um, um, watch here and see um, I should go through. Our own system, it's called Synwater and based on very flexible uh, uh, reverse osmosis uh, modules can be activated in a very wide range from 50 to 150 uh, percent. An integrated load management, we have a basic functionality what allows uh, a strongly wind dependent processing and an extended functionality. This is more uh, a yeah, strategic thing to, to deal with flexible tariff and demand scenarios. Uh, yeah, this containing a little bit of this smart grid philosophy. Yeah, so and it's a modular system. Uh, and what pictures we have here? You can see uh, uh, one module. The the ultrafiltration. It's not uh, it's not mandatory. We can replace it in case of having a beach wells. Uh, with a with a uh, low level or, or with a, with this more simpler prefiltration, um, yeah, and um, 
coming to the end, uh, I uh, give some basic uh, figures, uh, some, some basic uh, economic figures. Uh, before we go into these uh, details, uh, let me clarify what we are speaking about. See what desalination as a wind-powered industrial process we mean. This is a desalination capacity of minimum 500 cubic meter per day, and it can be upscaled. So there's no limit. Yeah, you can do it with one turbine or with one wind farm. The principle is every time the same. We speak about grid connected systems. That means not uh, no off grid or standalone solutions. We we start from the assumption only fully automated systems and only commercially. Uh, available standard components are used so and that's why in contrary to that what is not meant is uh, we don't speak about small scale applications or off grid solution this is something special but it's not uh, considered here in this economic investigation and special solution that means mechanical coupling of wind turbine and pumps for the RO system uh, this is Principally possible, that can be done, but uh, our investigation or our figures coming on the next slides is based on these uh, more simple uh, or more common uh, configurations. So um, here you see the assumptions. Maybe later on, it is for download these figures. You can go to that. Um, we investigated a wide range uh, of uh, project parameters, interest rate, and investment for turbine. There is a, a range considered for operation maintenance costs, the range, the feed-in tariff may range, um, and capacity factor. This stands for the wind, the wind resources at site. Yeah, if it's more medium, then you come down to lower than 20%. If it's in good to excellent wind, wind uh, location, then you come up to 40%. So, And here you have, for the reverse osmosis, you have investment, uh, operation maintenance, and energy consumption ranges as well. No CDM effects are considered. And now uh, let me come to the, to the um, uh, analysis or to the results. This uh, table here shows the application fields of conventional desalination, standard uh, wind power desalination, and uh, uh, desalination with extended capacities. What does it mean? Here, down here, you can see the grid tariff, and it is very dependent on the grid tariff. Simply said, if the grid tariff is very low, uh, or you can see uh, you, you get the conventional power from grid more or less as a gift, then simply said, take the gift and run your desalination process conventionally without any load management or so on. And you come down to relatively low water cost because your energy uh, share is um, go down to zero. But then you have a very wide range where the most uh, economic solution is a wind-powered uh, system with load management. You have no, only the standard capacities. You have no additional ones. But you have these flexible standard capacities, and you, you run with the load management. And you can see here there is a very wide range where this system is the most economic one. And then, let's say, uh, start from maybe 5 to yeah, 15, something like that. And then there is a certain level of grid tariff. When it, the grid tariff is so high, let's say higher than 12, 10 to 12 euro cent, then it m might be worth to do more to keep your own wind power into your desalination system. And you, uh, it is recommendable to place um, a little bit more desalination capacity in order to use surplus energy in very strong wind periods. So, and, and then this is the most uh, 
um, economic solution. And you can see the more uh, you have these capacities, the more you are independent of grid tariff increase. Here you can see the, the gradient of all these come down to zero. If the grid tariff is increasing, the, the overall costs of water are still the same. So, okay, it's, uh, now we, we come to an end. This is what we are doing from fact-finding mission at the beginning to final operation management. This all can be done from our side. And yeah, now I come to the end. Many thanks. And now I'm happy to ask questions, uh, to, to answer questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Joachim, for this uh, very interesting presentation. Um, so uh, the audience is invited to proceed uh, to send their, their questions. I think that now it's uh, much more clear uh, what the capabilities of uh, renewables, uh, more particularly wind energy, uh, are. Um, there are some processes which uh, can be coupled because of their natural storage capacity and uh, flexibility of the process itself can be uh, easily coupled to uh, variable um, renewables. Um, then, well, um, I think that's a great analysis. Um, just um, to, to, to test whether um, this analysis and this um, well, project avenue uh, is um, well being introduced in the in the market. Uh, can you mention, uh, Joachim, some um, some examples of um, of projects that you that you are running today, or some um, illustrations of uh, these uh, capabilities? Uh, what we ourselves, as I said, we ourselves we uh, we started with that uh, three years ago. We we did, or let's say, four years ago, we did did these basic investigations, as I, as I have shown to you, what about the membrane behavior under strong variable um, conditions. And from last year on, we felt ready to, to offer this uh, um, system. And the situation, as for us ourselves, is um, that we, we built the first module here in Berlin just now. So this is the situation at the moment. Um, what we learned is there are different uh, uh, actors or different parties in the market have installed, um, uh, for instance, in Greece, uh, um, pilot projects. Um, Honestly speaking, I'm not informed about all technical details, but there are some pilot projects for wind-powered desalination uh, in a smaller scale. I don't speak about the, the uh, Australian things because Australian is uh, it is it is um, presented as a wind-powered desalination in a large scale, but at the end of the day, it is a it is a wind farm some hundred kilometers away from the desalination feeding into the grid and in the same grid some hundred kilometers away uh, desalination among other consumers take energy out of the grid. So this is from from the overall balance it might be uh, energy comes in and comes out and there are two partners who are connected with each other. But this is not what we really mean in integrated solution and that's why this integrated solution who we know are for the for the wind power side in a pilot still in a pilot stage and we hope that next year we can deliver the first uh, the first modules to different places in um, yeah as well as Africa and Arab world thank it is you yeah thank you very much so um, we have the first question from the audience um, does it make sense thermal storage uh, from electricity source? Better to consider it just in case of a heat source. Um, what can we tell about this? I suppose that, well, we are talking about electro process, which means that uh, the use of electricity is compulsory for this process. 
Um, but, well, I'll give you the floor. Does it make sense, thermal storage from an electrical source? Yeah, principally, uh, honestly speaking, um, maybe there's one, some more explanation about uh, better to consider it just in case of heat source. From our point, in general, as, as we said, uh, if it's possible to bypass the option of energy uh, storage and to, to store on the product side, then this is, in, in all our calculations, this is the most economic one. Um, we know uh, energy storage, it's in, in, in some cases, it is necessary. But especially for desalination, we would vote uh, in every time to run it with a, uh, yeah, with, a, with a load management and to store on the product side. Um, provided, uh, or, or if not, as we, we have in Australia, there is a special agreement that that uh, the, 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 the grid operator is saying, you give me energy and you take energy, and we put both things together, and if it's zero, then you have to pay nothing. If this is the case, then a load management is not necessary. But in all other cases, we would prefer load management and store on the product side. This is much, much uh, more economic. If, if such a thermal storage for other purposes is interesting, honestly speaking for that, I'm not the final expert and I would not uh, assess this finally. Thank you. So next question. Um, membrane process are the future. Um, how about when you get the heat free of charge, for instance, waste heat from a thermal power station? Is yeah. that part of mainstream in the market? This is uh, Hans, this is a uh, uh, this is a widely discussed uh, question. Um, of course, uh, when you have, uh, when you get heat for free, then in this case, uh, everybody is thinking about, uh, sh can I use it? And then the distillation or the thermal processing is on the table. But um, when you speak with the experts, and they're really experts, they come up with a, with a simple uh, uh, calculation and they say, uh, waste heat. This, even this word is it's not really correct. It, it sounds like I have to waste it. When I take uh, the heat behind the power generation process away, then I reduce the efficiency of the power generation process. That means it's not really waste. So, and that's why um, when you when you uh, calculate this detailed and exactly, then even for that one, you would come down run the thermal process efficient and don't take uh, heat out of the process, run it in, with the maximum efficiency and take the energy you have for a membrane process. This is, but uh, we all learned that this is a lot of history behind uh, this combination. It's, it's widely established and it's still today um, uh, in in many cases, uh, it will be uh, implemented, but it is an, um, it is on decline. This is our, of course, um, from the energy point of view, the reverse osmosis to run it purely with electricity, wherever it comes from, is uh, is the, the better solution. But I have to admit, you ask other uh, experts very in favor of the thermal one. They may come up with this lot of uh, arguments uh, in favor of the thermos, but this is my view on that. Okay, thank you very much. Next question, how do you compare membrane distillation versus reverse osmosis? There are, in, yeah, the, 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 um, membrane distillation, uh, the, the figures I know is that the energy consumption is higher than uh, compared to reverse osmosis with the, with the pressure exchanger high level energy recovery system. So um, I cannot see at the moment this, 
that there are really advantages. But I have to admit here as well, there are experts for membrane distillation, especially in that, from Fraunhofer Institute in Freiburg here. And they should give a more uh, detailed answer on that. Okay, good. So next question, could you please let us know where you have installed or applied your systems? What yeah. kind of problems you have to deal with during these installations? So as I said at the beginning, uh, end of last year, we allowed ourselves to say, now we are ready to, to offer a, a whole system. And at the moment, we built the first module here in Berlin to deliver it next year. To, uh, to one of these projects we are developing. That's why uh, w the only thing what we can speak about is our test facility we bought here. And this, as I said, was working very robust against the uh, considering these fluctuating and flexible processing. But again, uh, large scale experience for a long time we don't have. Uh, but I would say, mm, I, I don't know anybody who has this with a really uh, variable uh, driven wind powered uh, reverse osmosis in a large scale. Uh, there, there are no long term experiences up to now, as I know. Yeah. Okay, very well. So, um, a last uh, question or comment. Electricity is difficult to store and reverse osmosis uses high pressure. If geography is available, such as high mountains nearby, would it make sense uh, to pump seawater upfill at variable quantities like a pump hydro system? And then this lets you draw down seawater at a constant rate and the pressure which you can fit directly to the salination unit. Well, I guess that uh, it's not that easy to <laughs> to build the yeah okay. unit. So we, we, we spoke about this issue. Principally, you're totally right. You have these two options. You can store before the process on the energy side, in which way ever you're doing. Uh, one option might be that you you're using the potential energy of water, and and so you you store a, a, a kind of electricity, uh, or the other. I showed is to store on the product side and, and as I said uh, in every case we would prefer that one so I, I do not exclude that this uh, in, in some at some locations it might be possible but I can that this is really more economic the way we did and I showed the figures uh, it has to be complete with that one and and uh, these these uh, uh, system in a, in, a, uh, in a special height, this is normally uh, very uh, cost intensive. So that's why I would, in general, I would say you can do that, but I, I wouldn't say this, this, uh, that there's really an economic benefit. Okay, great. So I think we came to the end of the, of the session today. There are no more questions remaining. So um, thank you very much, uh, Joachim. For the audience, uh, you will find the presentation recording in the link indicated in the lower right corner. Um, so um, you're welcome to, to keep uh, in touch uh, with the speaker today uh, if you have uh, concrete ideas, proposals, uh, etc. So thank you very much for your participation. And then now, uh, Joachim, I give you the floor to close the session. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Fernando. Uh, yeah, as I said, it was a great pleasure for me. It's, honestly speaking, it was the first time that uh, I presented uh, our, um, yes, our uh, presentation in, in, in a, within a webinar. So that's why this is uh, very new and imp impressive for me. And I learned a lot. And maybe you as well 
can take some uh, interesting aspects for you as well. And I would be happy to, to be in contact with one of you to speak about uh, the system and to uh, about kind uh, options for cooperation. Uh, I would be happy for that. And thanks a lot.